Hello everyone! Welcome back to Barney's Backyard. Today is the second episode of our gardening series. In the first episode, we have shown you how we built our backyard container vegetable garden. If you haven't seen it yet, make sure to check out in this link. And today's episode is all about how we turn the empty garden into this beautiful, lush, green vegetable forest around us. Let's go! This episode will consist of three parts. First, we will talk about our growing conditions. This will include our weather, our climate and other particularities of our growing season. In addition to that, we will also talk about the restrictions and limitations because of the area and space we are growing in. Second, we'll talk about the spring vegetables we have chosen to cultivate, why we chose these and how we've done it. And third, we'll talk about our best successes and worst disasters. We'll show you some of the, the threats, pests, diseases that might come in and try to ruin your growing season and we'll show you how and what to do so it doesn't happen to you. First up, the growing conditions. We live in Western Europe, close to the North Sea. Therefore, our climate is a temperate maritime climate, which is strongly influenced by the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. This means that our weather for most of the year is cool, cloudy and humid, we have temperate but frequent rains and also it can get quite windy. The last frost is around mid to late April, which is when our outdoor growing season starts. This lasts until mid to end October. With careful planning and indoor germination, we decided to squeeze two seasons into this short time, spring and summer. As for our backyard, it's a small and narrow space surrounded by tall walls which means that the lower something is located, the less sunshine it gets. Now, to provide enough sunshine for our plants and safe space in our garden, it is crucial that we will grow our vegetables vertically. With all that said, let's start talking about the top 5 spring vegetables we have chosen to cultivate. Number 1, the pea. Pea is one of the most iconic spring vegetables and rightfully so. It's fast growing, it tolerates mild frost, and it brings an abundance of sweet and juicy produce into your kitchen from early on. You can grow them for their pots, or you can hold off with the harvest and wait for the peas inside. There are many varieties around, so you can always find one that's best fitted for your conditions. It is a plant that inherently likes to climb, grow upwards, and thrives when planted closely, making it a perfect choice for our garden. Last but not least, peas are part of the legume family, meaning that they form a symbiotic relationship with rhizobial bacteria in the ground and that translates into them making their own fertilizer. Now, they are self-fertilizing, but what that also means is that once you harvest them and you take out the plants, they leave behind a nitrogen-rich medium for the new plants to go into. So let's talk about how we grow them from seed to harvest. This is the same ground that we used outside for filling our containers. It's 50% potting soil and 50% worm castings. We inoculated the peas for better germination. We are using long plastic cups with holes on the bottom to make sure there is enough space for the roots and for the water to drain away. For the best results, compress the ground slightly and plant your peas about 2 knuckles or 4 cm deep. Our secret for a head start on your seedlings is adding some seed starter mix. This stuff is rich in critical nutrients to seed development and mycorrhizal fungi which boost root growth through symbiosis. Place one pea in each hole, cover them up and gently tap it down. At the end, make sure you water all of them. These plants grow incredibly quick. They have proper roots and a few leaves already at 5 days old, so make sure not to keep them in longer than 10 to 14 days to avoid being root blocked. And here we are, planting the peas. Generally, when transplanting your seedlings outside, there are four points that are good to be aware of. You can find the starter mix in the description. Number one, water them the night before, so it's easier the next day to take them out of the pot. Number two, don't keep them in the small pot for too long, so they don't get root bound. Number three, 
transplant them at the right time and right weather conditions for that particular plant so they don't get stunned. Number four, make sure you harden them off by gradually bringing them outside for longer and longer periods at a time before transplanting them out. As for the peas, you can already bring them out one to two weeks before the last frost and you can plant them tightly two to three centimeters apart in a row. Make sure you provide some trelly or support so they can grow vertically and save you a ton of space. They are beautiful. Mm. Number two, salad. There are countless varieties, different colors, flavors, textures. There are head salads, there are leaf salads, but regardless of whichever you choose, they are all perfect for the spring vegetable garden. They grow even faster than grass, thrive in partially shaded, shaded areas as well, and require little to no help. Care. <laughs> okay, this makes it the perfect plant to plant out just after the last frost, and you can also use it as a fast producing filler throughout the year. Let's see how we went from seed to harvest. Smaller pot, such as this one. The same pot can make a sprinkle of seed starter and make a hole. I'm going to add two to three seeds with a little bit of ground. This doesn't need to be pushed down as much. And this is it. We will water everything at the end to make sure that they are staying moist. They germinate very fast. After a week or two you can already bring them out and they keep producing an abundance of fresh salad which you can harvest day after day. Look at the forest. They are absolutely delicious. Another perfect candidate for spring vegetables, number three on our list, the spring onion. Also known as scallions or bunching onions, spring onions are actually young onions that are harvested before the bulbs can form. Albeit they grow slower than number one and two on our list, they are a cold resistant plant that grow beautifully when sown tightly in small spaces, bringing an unexpectedly high yield of produce throughout the entire growing season. You can trim the top of the plants for fresh chives and you can start harvesting them from a young age, continuously thinning them out and providing more space for the remainder to grow. So let's see how we went from seed to harvest. We would also like to get some spring onions and leeks in our garden. So again, filling a smaller plastic pot this time. This also has holes in the bottom, seed starter. I'm going to add the seeds, about 10 to 12, and then add about a centimeter of ground. Afterwards, of course, we want to water them. Despite common belief that you have to thin them out, we highly suggest not to do that. It's called bunching onion for a reason. By picking them out and using gradually, you will make space anyways. Number four on our list is the humble radish. Another fast growing, low maintenance, cold resistant crop, which offers a surprising variety of colors, shapes, sizes, and flavors. Types ranging from small ones, size of a walnut that are ready from seed to plate under a month, all the way to the mighty daikon, which grows up to half a meter long and weighs over three kilos. They grow excellent in tight little bunches, tolerate shade extremely well, making it the perfect spring vegetable for our container garden. Let's see how we went from seed to harvest. The next thing we are going to plant today are radishes. We use the same ground and starter mix that we use for everything else. Radishes you can plant tightly, about 100 in a 50 liter pot like this. You can even put two to three seeds in a hole.
Cover them with ground, tuck them in, water them well, and make sure to keep them moist in the coming days. Then they will grow beautifully and super quick. Yeah. In about four to six weeks, you can start harvesting your very own homegrown radishes. Pick them as soon as they come to size for the ultimate juicy, crispy, spicy radish experience. Our last choice for our spring top 5 is a childhood favorite of ours, a scarcely known plant, Sora. It's a perennial herbaceous plant from the Polygonaceae family, also known as the buckwheat family. What that means is that it's a leafy vegetable similar in looks to spinach, growing in large bunches. Its distinctive sour flavor comes from the oxalic acid inside the plant. It contains high amounts of vitamin C, minerals, calcium, phosphor, iron, magnesium, and vitamin A. Due to this, it's believed to have beneficial effects on circulation, metabolism, and the immune system. It can be eaten raw, used in soups, used in stews, or our personal favorite, pureed into a sauce. So let's see how it went from seed to harvest. I'm gonna do the same thing, same ground mix. I have here eight little pots, eight, nine little pots, a little bit of the starter mix. Normally you can just seed these in the ground directly and there is gonna be no problem with that. The reason why we pre-started these guys is because last week, last weekend, we still had minus 10 and 30 centimeters of snow. So we really needed to, to get these guys a head start. Spread all these remaining seeds, it's gonna make Little holes, tiny little holes everywhere. Now sorrel is something you don't have to plant really deep. They have very tiny seeds that they germinate really fast and they will grow kind of like a, a weed. They grow really fast, they grow really, really large roots. And really this is not a plant that you have to worry about taking care of that much. As long as you provide the proper uh, medium to grow inside and you keep it watered up, this plant will definitely bring you a lot of pressure. So, for the third and final part of our video, we are going to discuss our best successes and our worst disasters. Let's start with the successes. For our first attempt, we are having a beautiful growing season. All the preparations in carefully selecting and mixing the soil, nurturing our plants inside before transplanting, and tending to them regularly paid off big time. For weeks now, we have been harvesting more than what we can eat from our top 5 veggies on the list. Now, we could just easily end the video here on a high note, but then we wouldn't be entirely honest with you. There are challenges to a growing season. There are numerous threats that will show up and try to ruin your spring vegetables. And now we want to talk about these, so that won't happen to you. First up, the weather. Every gardener is at the mercy of the weather in the beginning of the growing season. Entire weeks of planning can go up in smoke should winter decide to stay a little longer. Now, this is exactly what happened to us this year. Based on decades of climate record, the last frost should pass around mid-April, at latest. Now, compared to that, at mid-April, we still had persistent snow and ice for days. This can seriously strand the growth of your produce, or in the worst case, entirely kill it off. You can work around the delayed spring by starting your seeds inside in a growing cabinet, or at least a DIY version of that. If you have already transplanted some plants outside and then you receive the late frost, you can protect your plants by using compost as mulch, spreading them tightly around your plants. And this will protect the young shoots and roots of the plant due to the heat generated by the decomposing top layer. Once your plants are established in the garden and are growing well, there are a plethora of new threats to start looking out for. With the weather getting better, all critters of the garden are becoming more active and it is time to start looking for pests. The number one enemy in our garden are snails and slugs. There is nothing worse than finding your carefully raised plants 
completely decimated the morning after you just transplanted them out. There are many different methods that can help you mitigate them. Our secret is early population control. Slugs and snails reproduce fast and in vast quantities, so it is critical to be vigilant and remove any you find as soon as they start appearing. You wouldn't believe how much you can curb the flood by removing large specimens before they can reproduce. If you still find yourself slowly losing the battle against them, you can use snail pallets around your precious crops to quickly dispose any of the snails in the area. Now, if you choose to do this, we would highly suggest to look for organic alternatives. Optionally, you can use barrier techniques to protect your plants in their most vulnerable phase until they are large enough to outgrow damage done by the snails. Finally, let's talk about some of the diseases that can come into the garden. So, a couple of weeks back in the first half of May, night temperatures steadily remained around 10 plus degrees Celsius and the day sometimes even went above 20 plus. The plants were feeling the impending summer and everything was booming like crazy. We even transplanted some summer crops outside. In the end, our enthusiasm was only answered by two weeks of constant rainfall, cloudy, humid, cold weather. Now, this is not entirely unexpected where we live, but it did bring into our attention multiple fungal and bacterial diseases that can happen in the garden. As an example, our lush and abundant produce of salad that we have been harvesting for weeks contacted white rust, a fungal disease that appears due to the constant humidity present on the leaves. As with most other fungal diseases, once the plant has been infected, there is little to no recourse to saving it for the organic gardener. Mm -hmm. Best practice is to just remove all the infected leaves and harvest the salad before it can spread further. As such, we have 6.5 kilos of salad in our fridge now. Now I've got another video lined up coming out very soon, dedicated to the critters of the garden, where we'll talk about in much more detail and diversity about the different pests, critters, things that can appear in your garden and how you can deal with it. So for now, I want to leave it on a note saying that when you are gardening, especially if you are doing organic gardening like we are doing here, the most important thing is early prevention. You have to look out, you have to visit your garden every day, you have to be on the lookout for these things. And once they appear, you have to look into it, you have to find out what is it exactly that you are dealing with, understand the life cycle of the, the pest and disease that you are dealing with, and just completely halt the life cycle. Remove the plants into quarantine if you need, remove the leaves that are affected, do whatever it takes to I'll get rid of the entire thing and make sure that it cannot reproduce and start spreading. Despite all the curveballs thrown at us, with a little care, we still managed to have an amazing growing season. It has been a wholesome and rewarding experience and we can only encourage you to try some of this at home. It is those things that you have to work for and continuously put effort in that feel the sweetest and most rewarding when you achieve them. Besides, we feel that it's important to find modern solutions to keep in touch with nature in this ever accelerating world. So we hope you took something away from this video. If you liked it, make sure you give us a subscribe and a thumbs up. It immensely helps the channel. And with that said, we'll catch you next time. But you were doing really good, let's restart. No, I'm not restarting, fuck this. We are going from here, you're gonna cut it there. <laughs>